Go, I think we're going live. <laughs> hey, everyone. Welcome to today's live stream. Uh, we are here for part two of our very special series uh, for AECO. Uh, and we have the AECO Avengers assembled here for you today. <laughs> um, I'm Wendy. I'm here with uh, Edmar, your community team, and uh, really excited to uh, actually talk about uh, assembling a project and getting that together. But uh, before we go into today's show, Edmar, what are some things we need to talk about? I, one thing that I wanted to bring up is the uh, there's a Dev Jam uh, Monday, December 19th um, for Generative AI and Omniverse. So uh, check that out if you're a developer and you want to kind of play around with Generative AI and Omniverse. This Dev Jam is for you. So make sure you join in on it's a uh, 10 10 30 pacific <laughs> on monday december 19th <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's so timely right it's been in the news the headlines almost every day, day recently. <laughs> uh, so definitely jump Absolutely. in for that uh the dev jam and all of our events are always listed on the, our ad event calendar which i'll post in the chat in a second so you can quickly see uh what we're doing and you can add them to your own calendar very easily if you are on our discord server uh you can always go to the events at the top left and, the, and just click on the ones you're interested in you'll get a notification on discord when they happen that's always a good way to uh to be notified um speaking of which this week we actually have three streams so aeco is first at bat but uh then tomorrow on our regular stream time we have our holiday special which uh um for those who who may not remember uh, one of wendy's favorite things is our holiday themed uh live streams <laughs> See, we'll see what she brings to the table tomorrow, but we're going to have some awesome people from the team uh, kind of showing off what they've done for our Winter Art Challenge, uh, which is in full swing, where you can use Omniverse to create some kind of holiday theme image or animation. And uh, if you look at our Discord channel, we have a channel for that, and you can see what people have been sharing. We're going to look at some of that stuff. We're also going to talk to Ashley, who has been working with uh, a professor and their students on creating some holiday themed extensions. Uh, which uh, it should be really fun to see. So that's more developer focused. Jen Baruki on the extensions team from NVIDIA is also going to show off something she's been working on, which uh, I believe is a holiday string lights that uh, light up in sync with music in, uh, in Omniverse. And I think she has it connected to Spotify. So that's pretty cool. So we'll see that. And then uh, for the, the, the triple, we've got Dave Tyner will be joining us tomorrow also, and he will be showing off what he's been doing, what he started last Friday, which is a live sync with uh, three other developers from the Omniverse team. I think it's four all together, yeah. And they, uh, so they've been basically working from all over the world, uh, building this holiday scene together in real time. So really showing how Omniverse collaboration works and how to set it up and everything. So he's gonna show off what they've been working on there. Um, and that's all tomorrow. And then Friday, uh, Dave Tyner is back again. He's uh, we're creating an, uh, a live stream uh, addict. He's back again on Friday, and he is going to be um, working with Marcom 3D, who most people are also probably pretty familiar with. Who does great Omniverse content um, from the community, and he's working on a Star Wars themed animation. So Dave Tyner and him are going to collaborate in real time, working on this uh, scene using assets. I think they pulled from uh, some one of the asset stores. Um, it might be might be Sketchfab. So. So three live streams this week, they're all on our events channel. Um, and then uh, finally, just make sure, uh, as we talked about earlier, if you're using Omniverse, we'd love, to, uh, we'd love to know who you are so you can fill out the insider form on the community page. And I'll post a link in the chat. Uh, but without further ado, uh, we've got the Dream Team here uh, for their follow-up live stream, as Wendy said. So, uh, so Dream Team, uh, let me start with Krista, because Krista, I think, has been uh, the ringleader, uh, kind of putting all this great content together for, uh, for our community. What, uh, what, um, you want to recap what we did last time really quick? And then what, what's this one going to be focused on? Sure. Yeah. This is the second of our first two sort of foundational series on, um, Omniverse for the ACO industry. The first one was all about, um, a very high level introduction to what USD, the final format is and how it's, how it's being used to, um, push the industry in a, in a very different, but very great direction. Um, and then this second one, we're going to be talking more about how to get actually get started with your projects in Omniverse, um, how to utilize the um, functions of USD and Omniverse to improve your project workflows, and how to get a project properly set up. Awesome. Fantastic. And then um, uh, oh, everyone who's watching, we would love for you to post any questions or comments, um, chat with each other uh, in the Twitch chat or the YouTube chat. 
Uh, and any questions you have for the team, we'll, we'll try to uh, interject at the right moments and ask. So uh, now's, your, now's your time to, uh, to talk with us. Um, okay, so who's going to, uh, who's going to start this show? I will. This is Jay. Jay! <laughs> you win. Are we uh, sharing screen? Oh, okay, so excellent. So let me... Let me share your screen. Okay, you're good. <laughs> okay, excellent. Hi, everyone. My name is Jay Axe, and um, I'm part of the AECO team. And we're going to start talking about these five core concepts of USD and Omniverse that you may be aware of these terms if you're an advanced user or if you use these every day, there might be something new or interesting we can share, tips and tricks. And it's also great for just getting started. Um, these are the core um, elements that we use for project assembly. So we'll go through each one of those step-by-step step, and I have a few examples to share. And that'll be the, the, the first part of uh, our talk today. So let me dive right in. Okay, and to get started, this will be the only side-by-side -side for today. So on the, on the left, we have 3ds Max, and we're showcasing the 3ds Max connector to get content from your DCC source to Omniverse. And this could be the same for any application that you're using that has a connector. So Revit, Rhino, SketchUp, Blender, all of them apply. And the reason I want to show this really quickly is just to show a fundamental um, concept when you're working with one USD file. So in Max, if you move an object like this or SketchUp or anything else and save the file, you'd automatically expect that to be saved in the file. You're just working in one file. Same thing, like you delete it, you save it, you come back tomorrow, you'd expect that object to be gone because that's how you saved um, the native file and information. This is identical when working in USD. So if you're going to work in just one specific USD that was exported from the source application connected to Omniverse, um, you could expect that the same behavior, you grab an item, you move it, you're doing edits to the USD file. There's no connections to a bigger system. This is just native USD editing. We'll, we'll come back to why that's important. Um, an, an example of where this could be um, necessary to complete a task is that maybe you want to have some of the elements from this file separated and put into a prop or a specific location. So you want to have the ability to select an item, delete it, like if we don't want that, and I'll get rid of the frame for a moment. So maybe I want to save um, this as a prop. So I did one of these as an example, and just really, really quickly I'll open that USD file. So I took a few of those elements, something that was from um, your source application, whether it was Revit, Rhino, or SketchUp, you bring that into Omniverse, and then you just continue working on it. We're going to call that editing the source or native USD editing. The, the idea is that you're making permanent edits. Okay, moving on to the next step, I'd like to talk about references. So let me pull up that real quick. Here, I can do it right here. So we just talked about editing a um, USD file. And also, if you were to look at the code for that, we're not asking anyone to look at code today, but if you were to um, look at the code, that's going to have all the information in one big file. With references, um, I want to show this cool new feature of, of Create that's going to come out in uh, 2022 3.1, where you can edit the USD file. And really, we don't care too much about what we see in here, but the idea is that you have... Um, these nice little links. So when we, we discuss Omniverse as uh, the internet of 3D worlds, or I'm sorry, the, the HTML of 3D worlds, really we're talking about these small little connections to uh, a series of different files that really at this point, it's just data and you're trying to connect all that data together uh, into one Omniverse world. So um, there is a direct correlation of all of the little links here to the references that we see in the stage. So at this point, you can do some pretty cool, pretty cool stuff with references. So let me fly around the scene for a second and um, just show you how we can do, we can look at the asset paths for references. So I'll start with this candle. And if you scroll down in your properties in, in, uh, in the create window, you can see that there is a, oh, let me first 
select the model. So we're going to click on um, the model from here. So if you scroll down to references, you can see it's just pathing to a specific file location on disk. If we wanted to change that path, you can type something in as one example. So um, I know that I have a reference in the scene for chair. So for, if I wanted to swap that candle to a chair, I can simply just type in chair. And this is the power of um, references in Omniverse. Is it really we're just connecting to different data, whether it's on disk or within Nucleus? Here, let me try that one more time. Um, and for this example, notice I have two specific chairs that are um, they're identical. And if we want to add a little bit of variety in our scene, you can um, switch from um, model to prim, and we can actually select one of those items within the reference. And we can either hide it or delete it. Um, this is part of um, non-destructive workflow in a sense that we're really just pulling data into our Omniverse world. We're not editing the source like I showed in that first part. So you can be very comfortable in when you're using references to really manipulate the data however you want so that you can build your scenes um, uh, with purpose, right? So you have predictable results. Um, another cool feature of references that we can pull from um, the, we can use the NVIDIA assets to show this for, for an example. Um, I'm going to path over to, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things you can choose, but there's some wall sculptures that'll work in this example pretty well. So if I select um, the reference they have for the painting, which came from my, um, the original export with the connector, there's this cool feature where you just right click on any of um, the items in the catalog and you can replace the current selection. So that's going to automatically swap out the reference path for the data that I had on disk to um, something that is in Omniverse. And you can do this as many times as you want. Um, it's really just changing that um, reference or asset path. So um, you can be pretty efficient and organized with um, how you are trying to find data and really build these little design variations and setting up your scenes exactly how you want uh, very comfortably and, and quickly. So that's a pretty powerful way of using uh, references, USD references in Omniverse. Next, I'd like to switch to payloads. So let me pull up that one. And what's, what's great about payloads is all the great features of references that I just showed, they're all available in, in payloads as well. And, and a way to show that um, how references and payloads work really well together is that you can simply convert them back and forth. So this chair right now is a reference. You saw when I opened the scene, everything just automatically populated and loaded into the scene. If we were to right click on that and we convert that to a payload, now you have a little bit of extra controls about how that is being brought into the scene. So if I select um, the chair, we can scroll down and you can see it's no longer a reference. Now it's a payload and you have this checkbox here that lets you load it in and out of memory. And you can see in the stage, we still have this nice placeholder for where that chair is, but it's not part of the scene beyond what you see in the stage. This is extremely valuable for building large worlds in Omniverse, especially for your project assembly. So this concept here um, will be very important as we go through the rest of our, our talk. Um, and to show one more cool thing about payloads is that you can select a whole bunch of items in your scene. And I'm going to not include the wall and um, yeah, the little artwork on there. So let me convert these really quickly to payloads. And if I save the scene, so I'll just do a quick file save and save that. And this time, I'm not going to double click to reload that scene. I'm going to right click and open with payloads disabled. So this just opened everything um, normally in the scene. The references appear as you see. That those are these three items. But everything that is a payload um, is not loaded into memory. And if I want to just open it normally by a double click, you can see that those payloads automatically appear. So it's really you're giving the you're getting the controls to um, how much data you want to load, whether you're working in large worlds, small worlds, or um, trying to you know decide what is relevant to have uh, load uh, on demand. And also in the columns, I want to show really quickly there is a payload checkbox. So while you're working, you can simply just check the box on the right. So you can see that will load that share in and out of memory. So the, the combinations of everything we just described with references and payloads, this is fantastic for getting your 
scene setup um, with intended results when you open and close files. Okay, next we'll move on to layers. And probably most of you have seen a demo on um, layers before. Um, but what's, what's really cool is that you can have layers set up in multiple ways. So as a very straightforward way of, of demonstrating this today, I'm gonna go to the layers tab and just show that we have this base layer. And I actually just applied simple edits to different USD layers. So this first one I call add pot. So I created a pot or in, a, in a, a different context and then loaded that into the scene and you can see I've added a pot. So that information is on this USD layer. And you've probably heard it described as uh, any system like Photoshop that has a layering system, it's usually, it's the highest layer that wins. So if there's no pot on this lower layer, well, then it's not gonna be involved. So if I hit this mute button here to just disable that layer, you can see that that pot has disappeared. So I can really quickly pull in lots of edits and say like, okay, let's see what this looks like with a brick wall. Awesome, we've, we've got a brick wall. Here, let me turn this off. Um, maybe I want to move the chairs around. So in another layer, I put some edits to slide these chairs over to the right side of the screen. And you can see you can quickly just add and remove and change things. So like this lamp, I felt like it got a little busy. Let's move that to the left side of the screen. So all of these different edits are being stored in tiny USD files that um, are building built up into a layer stack. And just to describe that concept of the, the highest... Um, layer always wins. We're going to add a layer that makes a concrete wall. And if we want to go down in the stack to see that brick wall, I'm simply just going to hide that layer. So by muting it, you can see we've revealed the bricks. So you can work with layers to really quickly, you know, um, iterate on your design, or you can set up different uh, design options. So in this sense, I've put all the edits in different layers so we could quickly swap them in and out. You could do full design layouts, um, design options, or variations on your scene, um, all stored in these different um, USD layers. And it all comes apart of, uh, it's all part of deltas, which we're gonna switch to the next section. Um, and, and one last point on the layers, you can take this entire stack that you've created save this USD, and then when we start building our large worlds, you can bring that in as a payload or a reference. So you can keep all of this content um, in a quote unquote live sense where you can always return to that sub world, adjust your layers, and then hop back into the larger world, which we'll get to in a little bit. Okay, moving on to deltas, number five. Let's get that one up. Now, I've been showing deltas all along, but we haven't looked at them specifically. So now we're going to, whether you're working with your references, your um, payloads or layers, these are all creating delta edits. And you, there are other USD terms such as uh, defs and overs. This is all in Omniverts. It's being um, represented in the stage and layout UI as a, as a delta edit, okay? So any adjustment that you make to the scene, so let's just move the chair, for example, you can see in the layers that we're automatically getting some little delta change here. So I can click on any one of those, and if I were to remove those deltas, you can see that the chair moves back to its original source. So this is the power of non-destructive editing with USD layers, payloads, and, and references. And this really gives you the freedom to experiment because you can make changes and not worry about, um, you know, disturbing files that are on a, a big system. If you don't want, to, if you're concerned about, you know, breaking your a file that a, uh, you know your colleague made and you didn't want to mess something up, working with payloads and references uh, and USD layers this way really allows you to do that non-destructive editing, even to the point where if you delete things out of the scene, so. Let's say I just start going crazy and I want to you know, delete stuff. You can see that each one of these deletes like this, these are all being stored as, as um, deltas. So if I want that wall to come back, I can delete the delta and it has returned. So um, the delta edits are, are fantastic for um, collaborative workflow, non-destructive editing, and, and really just being able to organize um, any changes that you make to the scene are being stored in these little uh, delta edits that you can always see in the, the layer panel. Okay. Let's move on to the USD variants. And this is a fun one. 
actually, we're going to start with a fresh scene for USD variants. So for USD variants, um, there are many ways to, to build them. You can build them in code. We have an extension in Omniverse that this is a third-party extension that I, I don't believe is released right now, but I can show this as an, ex an example extension of Omniverse. Oh, and we're not loading. Um, okay, so we'll do a quick reopen of create. That should not be a problem. Um, let's see if I can do that quickly. While the, I'll let that load in the background. So let me launch that. But while that is reloading, we'll just skip the creation of the variant tool. So here's an example of a variant that has already been created. In this context, it's been, it was as simple as you have a series of things from the, here, let's go up to the decor. So you can pull any item from the NVIDIA assets catalog just as an easy way to get started with USD editing. And once you've created that, you can go to your columns. And, oh, not columns. Let's go to our stage and our columns. Here we can show variants. So for a variant that's already been created, like this one example here, you can see there's a drop down for, there's four different USD files that are all connected here. And once that's put, put into, you can see that I've grabbed a few things from the catalog and really just made it so I can hot swap, load in and out of memory, um, all of these different assets uh, efficiently. And great, I, now I have a new create open, so we can show that real quick. So you get to see, you can go to extensions, we're going to look at a third-party extension. Let me drop that in here, and we'll load the variant tool. That should be happy now. Great. And all we're going to do is we're going to create a variant from files. So we have this nice little extension in Omniverse. This will be integrated in some manner in Create, but it may look a little bit different. So this is just showing an example of how to create a um, USD variant. So. Let me go back to the, the residential decor. Excellent. So creating um, USD variants are very simple in this case. So I can just drag and drop a few different items into this nice little window here. All you have to do is give it a prim name. So we'll just call it sculpt. There we go, sculpt a variant. And then when I hit create, we're going to watch in the stage here. I've cre we've created this little variant that comes in as a reference. Let me get this window out of the way, make the screen a little bit bigger. And like I showed before, if you go to columns and um, variants, we can quickly switch between um, those USD variants. Now let, let's take a look at this in a, a bigger context. So let me real quick, I'm gonna lose the previous one. We've got two creates going, so goodbye to this one. Okay, cool. So let's go to our variants. So I have this nice little scene set up um, that once that loads uh, into memory, you're going to see all the MDLs compile. And there we go. And another nice feature of Create that is new is that you have different lighting rigs set up. We're going to use Gray Studio because it looks fantastic for these um, nice, even lighting for uh, these still lives. So now I'm gonna pull that variant that I created before. I'm gonna drop it right into the scene as a reference. And you can see that appears here. So we've got the blue payloads, we've got the orange variants, and you can do a drop down. You can see how I'm just using this as another uh, element of my scene. And you can continue using the, as many of these as you like. Uh, in this context, we're using USD variants to quickly switch uh, the reference paths for all of these different you know, cool little knickknacks. So, you can imagine the, the possibilities with, right now we're looking at small items on a table. Let's take this concept one step further and do it for uh, full scenes in, in Omniverse. So the example I have for you today, let me switch to a wide angle camera. Um, yeah, we'll do this one. I've, um, take, I've downloaded uh, about 20 different scenes from Evermotion. They're all 3ds Max V-Ray content. And you can imagine the amount of time taking, you could take data from, from 3ds Max, Revit, Rhino, or SketchUp, but imagine the time it takes to take, take all that information, load files, start rendering, yada, yada, yada. All we're gonna do is 
Now that all of this content has been converted to USD, we're just quickly doing a hot swap between all of these different USD references. So right now, imagine, okay, I'm gonna open Rhino and load a file and, and choose what render. We're not worrying about that. We're simply just going from one USD to another. And this is a total of about 20 gigs of data on disk. And you can see how I'm just hot swapping between these, you know, these beautiful little scenes. Um, at this point, it's pretty effortless and we're just kind of in presentation mode where loading all of this content very quickly, it gets loaded into your Omniverse cache. Once those MDLs compile, you have these nice, beautifully curated little scenes. And um, you can imagine all of these um, elements, whether they're large or small, coming from many different sources. This is the general concept of how we're pro um, assembling projects together so that we can build them into, into large worlds. And I think with that, that's probably a good time to, to hand it over to um, Sebastian for the, for the next station. Awesome. Thank you, Jay. That was a fantastic summary of all of those concepts. And so let me share. I have a couple slides and then we'll jump into a hands-on demo here. Let me flip. You guys make this look so easy. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm still, I never get used to the quality of the renders uh, in real time. It's insane. Really yeah. beautiful. Uh, you all can see the full screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so to recap on a couple points that uh, Krista made in our our last uh, our last Discord session, uh, we're looking at a few different ways of how do we actually put architecture together within Omniverse, and so that can be how do we actually start to structure these things? Because we all take we've showed a, a few great examples in terms of how all of these pieces come together, um, but re in reality, we'll take a look. Um, so. The main thing we always start with is this world file, which is our top level assembly file. And so we put things together. And as Jay said, anything that goes in as a reference payload or uh, layer is composed into that top level file. And each of these can, can open up as needed. And so with those, uh, if we look at something like the lobby file, um, we can have many different files built in underneath there, which ends up being a great way for us to not only be able to work in separate pieces, but also collect these things into assemblies. And so it becomes very clearly if one person wants to work on the lobby, what their file is composed of and where someone can find it. So it works on a basis where individual people can work on a project quite comfortably and as well as uh, building it out for many people to collaborate. And that can be with the layers, payloads, and references, however you choose to structure your file. Now, the main really important thing, again, is that since we build these out uh, from different applications, as well as within Create, we're able to collaborate from different locations and all either asynchronously or in real time. And so uh, to, to bring you through what an actual project folder structure looks like and how we have been assembling things, we have a few different folders that we like to set up as a base case. Of course, these can get a lot more complicated or even, uh, even simplified. So the top level world file, uh, sorry, world folder will basically allow you to have a place for all of the files that we know as our top level assemblies this is especially important when someone else is coming to the project, helping you out. We know staffing uh, has to ramp up and ramp down as needed. And so this way you're able to say, okay, my world file is in this specific location. I'm gonna go start with that. If you want to make some changes, for example, you're only working on the interiors, then you can go ahead and take that top level USD world file, save that out into an options folder. Additionally, anything that you think might be of a additional option uh, or a supplementary element to that world file, you may save out a separate USD for cameras or even environments like your sun and sky uh, or some sort of HDRI environment. Next, we have the source file. And so these we consider anything from our digital content creation apps like a Rhino, Revit, SketchUp, 3ds Max. And so all of those 
files are going to be nested and living within there. So that way we always know where what our world is built up of. Additionally, we have assets where these are elements that we think of as uh, disconnected from any type of application. So it's already USD file. It might be nested um, with its materials. And that gives you the opportunity to basically um, have those elements and drop them into any USD file that you have within your project or other projects. And so that way that could be like a chair or a tree or a fire hydrant within there and then materials. So we do have full export of our materials from our uh, DCC applications or source applications. However, if for example, you have a brick material or water material or something that you've created custom and you wanna be able to use that across the project in many different places, this is where you would store those materials. And so this kind of starts to uh, identify the folder structure and we'll look at that and create in a moment. Uh, and then we wanna take a look at our uh, file structure. And so this is where Jay started to mention how some of this stuff is already assembled. Um, but let's take a look at what might be in a architectural project file. So I'll, I'll give a little cheat sheet over here. And so we start with the world file, and this is always going to be your top level assembly. And we call it world because we do have sub assemblies, or um, we just call it assemblies, which are kind of these minor assemblies. But the main idea is the whole project lives there. You could always do a save as and save it as in your options folder. For example, as you know, if I'm working only on the restaurant, I don't need uh, all of the trees and environment and everything. However, as Jay showed us, uh, you can load those in as, as payloads and simply disable them. However, all of these things nicely live under the world file. We talked a little bit about environments and cameras, um, but what's, what's also necessary is that anytime you see, as we like to do, a prefix of the application that it came from, like Max or Rhino or Revit, what we like to do is make sure that we give that uh, a prefix. So that way we know that that is a source level file that we end up bringing in as a, a sub layer, but we don't touch that. The reason being is as you're working, we're not looking, we're looking to create um, projects that are always kind of alive and we're not looking at kind of stale data and information. Meaning if there's a Rhino file, I wanna be able to always go back and make those edits and design changes without having to completely redo my folder and project structure. And so if I have the RH site, for example, as a USD file, uh, that's the one I import and I don't touch that on, on the inside of create. You can do that for, for Revit, whatever it is that you bring in. Now, what happens when you want to make some changes? You wanna apply some materials in create and things like that. For example, if, if I were to open up an RH site within create, add a material, and then I export it again, that would rewrite it. So what we do is we create what we call assemblies. And the assemblies allow us to put things together into grouping. So for example, within here, we'll have something like an over file. And so we use over files as a way to be able to create edits on top of our source files. So I may import my Rhino file, I may apply a marble texture to the floor, and then I may say, okay, you know what, the texture mapping is off, or the floor needs to change, or the geometry needs to change, or move, or it's a table or a counter. Um, so I need to go back into my source. What this allows is using those deltas as Jay showed, you get to still apply that material, and it'll stay no matter how you change that, uh, that underlying geometry. And so this allows us to say, okay, we have an assembly, and an assembly, something like a lobby, which we'll go through in a moment, you can think of as its own uh, freestanding unit. So someone could be working on the assembly with all of these components. They can be dropping in uh, some elements. I could be exporting a Rhino file. And not everyone always needs to be in Create, but individual contributors. Someone could be working in Revit and never really touch this. So let's go ahead and see how this works in a project structure. And so here I have Create open. And so this is my top level uh, world file. And so if we take a look down here in my asset browser, uh, what you'll see in the content browser, you'll see these files that I, the folders that I spoke about. So I have my world file. I do have a few different ones in here only because it's a kind of a step-by-step -step example. I have options. So that's where I would save out some of my options. So if I wanted to tweak this one or someone else wanted to save as and 
tweak it and you know change the sky and and all of the elements and the water and materials they can go about doing that that could also happen in the main one and uh, then we have our materials and assets folder and then we'll talk about our source so we've gone back and forth about uh, about this a few times should assemblies live outside or should they live within the source folder uh, it's kind of up to you the way that I've thought about it within here is that as you get started, you're not really sure maybe of what that entire assembly might be, or maybe you will. So if you understand the assembly is going to be something like the entire lobby is going to be an assembly, you can go ahead and export it that way. Or if it's just a Rhino export, then you can go ahead and do that. So upon a Rhino export, what you would see is a Rhino lobby USD file that I export directly from uh, Rhino. And then I have a, you know, a supplementary materials folder that it'll export. So this is where I know that all of my files are that make up the project. Now, certain ways um, you can look at our demo pack one. This is using our demo pack two content. You could also take all of the assembly files or top level files, put them outside of this folder or in a separate folder. And so there are a few different ways to go about it. This is our kind of best practices that we like to look at. And so these are all of the files that we've put together within here. Now, if we take a look at the layer system, as Jay was talking about, uh, within here, at the moment, they're all inserted as layers. And so there are actual live um, edit layers that you can go in and edit as you wish. And so within there, we have the top root layer, which is going to be your main, whatever USD file you have open, the root layer is the actual USD that you have open. And then we have our lobby and restaurant, uh, the grasshopper facade, and so on. And so you have a number of different, you have a number of different um, examples within here. And so that all lends itself to nicely be able to um, be put together. And as Jay said, you can adjust the order in terms of editing. Additionally, as you see with this green highlight on top of the root layer, if I were to double click, it'll change the authoring layer. So there's a couple ways to be able to edit that individual USD layer, for example, like an environment. Uh, a lot of these are direct exports from the source layer, so I wouldn't make changes because I still plan to export and overwrite these layers. And so within that green uh, highlight, what that tells me is that I'm authoring to it. So for example, if we have, uh, you know, let's just say the lobby, I could, and let's say I was done editing from Rhino, what I could do is I can simply double click there and I can make some changes, or I can open that individual USD and create. And so quickly, let's go ahead and give it a shot. I'd like to make our own world file so I could show you that this example right here with just a few layers didn't take hours to produce, but minutes. And so if I go to File, New, I'm not gonna save this one, and then uh, the first thing I'm actually going to do is save. So I'll go ahead and save. I'm going to, I'm making a world file, right? So a collection, an assembly of all of my files. So I'm going to overwrite one that I've already produced. And let's just give it a little uh, zero one. So just in case, and then we'll go ahead and save that. The first thing I'm going to do is select my root layer. So by default, uh, Create's going to open up the files as uh, Y axis up. And so our architectural or AC apps are Z axis up, depending on, you know, media and entertainment or uh, architectural applications or engineering applications. So here we have our base scene. I can always go ahead and save and I'm saving to this. So first thing I'm going to do is bring in my underworld. I have environments. So I'm going to insert this as a sub layer. So I'll bring my environment in. So now we have a bit of uh, sunlight within here and kind of changes to my stage lights. And what we'll now do is bring in some of our geometry. So let's go ahead and we'll go to source and we'll start with the site. So go ahead and bring that in as well. If I zoom out, I could do a control A and then press S to frame the full scene. And then I can kind of move around a little bit. So now I have all my buildings, my water, and the adjacent properties. Next up, I want to bring in our base building that we exported from Revit. 
And so we'll go ahead and bring that in as its own sublayer. And you'll see, depending on the complexity, as long as your links are okay and everything else, it should, it should load relatively quickly. And this is an entire building, uh, base building in Revit that we you know, loaded in within seconds. Additionally, we'll then bring in some of our interiors. So I'll do the restaurant. So we insert that one, let that load for a sec. And then as we can uh, see within here, there's a little restaurant uh, at our ground level within there. So that's exported from as a Rhino file and exported to USD. Next up, we'll go ahead and add our uh, facade. So that is designed and exported as a USD directly from Grasshopper. And these can all be brought in as variants or payloads or references. There's a lot of different things that we can do within these in order to best either optimize their flexibility so I can turn things on and off, or in terms of the performance of the seed and how complex and difficult things get. This is a, a kind of truncated version of our uh, Demo Pack 2 seed. Uh, so that way we can have, you know, kind of high performance while screen sharing in order to be able to see this. But all of this is rendered in real time and we're not, you know, we're not baking anything out. Everything is saved out as USDs and able to be um, applied within here. So now lastly, uh, the last kind of component of this is I wanted to show you uh, how we can potentially make an assembly. So what I'm going to do is take a look at our assembly lobby folder. And so within here, I have assembly underscore USD. What comprises that is going to be a Rhino lobby file, which is directly linked to my Rhino file. And then I also have an over file where I can apply some changes like adding materials and other things. And so if I go ahead and insert this assembly, insert as sub layer, that will bring it in with everything underneath it. So as you can see within here, it's all nested. So if I hit the little uh, um, plus part, you'll see that over Rhino Lobby and Rhino Lobby are nested underneath that assembly. So the assembly, my colleague Jay could be working on and you know producing a whole restaurant or lobby or whatever it might be. And then I might import that um, from my file. I don't know what this loading element is, but uh, just delete that. Uh, and so, so within here, let's go ahead and take a look at how this nicely connects with our, um, with our project. And one thing I actually might do normally is open up the assembly file due to time. I'll just go ahead and uh, turn off my facade and even the base building. Those would be best, as uh, Jay would tell me, as uh, payload so we can unload them from memory. But this, this scene isn't so bad so far. Okay, so now we have this Rhino, uh, this Rhino file of our lobby independently. And so what we can do here is any changes that we want to make. So for example, if I were to take these elements here and uh, let's simply just move them, or actually I'll copy them. We need more seating. Uh, we've got a coffee shop here. We need people to hang out. So I've added some of these. Go ahead and save that out. And then I'm going to export this. And so I already have the location saved. So this is that same lobby file. And I'm going to simply, basically every time I export it, I'm going to overwrite that. Now that can work as me exporting and publishing a USD file every single time, or that I can simply create what we have as a live link, where as you make any changes in Rhino, that'll show up live. Sometimes that's uh, really helpful. Uh, in an example, one would be Grasshopper. So Grasshopper, you don't need to bake out your geometry, but it's live link within here. So I've exported that out. Now, if we jump back to create, we can see that it's asking me, hey, your Rhino lobby file is outdated. Can you please update it? Would you like to fetch the latest? So we fetch the latest, and now we can see that now we have our new tables. I'm gonna change this a little bit, maybe that gray studio. And I seem to have a uh, overlapping surface uh, issue here. So even if that might be the case, maybe I'll select this and move this up just the tiniest bit and then go ahead and let's republish that one. That way we don't have um, coplanar surfaces and our materials will show up. 
So as this is publishing out, and this currently is going to a shared uh, online server, hence the, the slight uh, delay within here, given my screen sharing. Uh, but that's going to allow me to now have a floor that's not complainer, and we'll take a look. And then I'll show you how I would use the over file. So as that publishes out, I'll go ahead and fetch the latest. And now we have that. So now if we take a look over here under root layer, and you have to always, you know, sometimes just be conscious of what layer you have open. I would go to, this would be a lot, this would be a little clearer if we only had assembly open, but this is the beauty of USD as, as uh, Jay mentioned and using some, an application like create with Omniverse is really that you have access to this entire layer stack no matter where you are. And so we can just have assembly open or it's in our larger project and we can only work on that. So if I go to over Rhino lobby, I'm going to apply a material. So let's say we go to stone, we select the floor and then I'm going to apply to selected. And then as you can see, okay, I've applied that and now I have this um, beautiful stone material. However, I'm gonna make one last change within here because my, my texture mapping is off, right? I could adjust that within the actual material within here, um, within the shader, or I can do that within my Rhino file. The last thing I'll do is simply go over here I'll go to texture mapping and I'll just set this to probably a, let's say a two meter by two meter spacing. And then we'll go ahead and export that one uh, one last time. And so what this allows me to do, as you'll see in a moment, is by creating this over file on top of my DCC export file or my uh, digital content creation, whatever you call it, your source file, as you export that, this allows you to now make any changes you want above that and in a non-destructive way. Because what would have happened is if I apply, if without that workflow, if I apply a material in, if I apply a material within, um, within create, then what would have ended up happening is every time I export that Rhino file, it would uh, cancel out those edits. So this is the best kind of you know, possible process so now we have assemblies, we have all of these files together. I can go ahead and turn uh, my building and my facade back on and all of that nicely um, you know, renders out. Of course, we could turn um, back our uh, sunlight settings and adjust that as we wish uh, as well. And so that kind of covers uh, my bit within here. So just to recap, in terms of how you set these things up, folders and layer structure matters. But what matters most importantly than what it's called or what the folder is called is consistency. As long as you and your team, or at least you know yourself or you and your team decide, this is what we're calling all the world folders and files. This is what we're calling the assemblies. And this is what we're calling the source folders or assets. Then that's how you know, projects become the best is just help you know, figure out that, that decision in the beginning, copy our example exactly, or choose and kind of edit as you wish um, what would be best for you guys. Now back to Jay. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. Um, so imagine everything that Sebastian was doing, all of your team members were doing that in their respective applications of choice, all connecting into Omniverse. So you could have someone working in Revit, somebody working in SketchUp, Rhino, it really doesn't matter. Um, all of this is happening in parallel and we're all pushing content to Omniverse. And if you imagine the, the layer stack, whether it was the small example I showed uh, with the little vignette of the room or the large project that Sebastian's working on, we're gonna take all of those workspaces, we call them source files or live workflow, all of these things connected to USD, and we're gonna bring them back into one world um, as, as payloads. And, and that's what I'm um, showing here, is that we have an overall world with a series of sub-levels, sub-scenes, um, USD layers. It's really depending on what part of the project it is. So if it's a live part of um, the Revit workflow, you could have a bunch of layers. If you're bringing in some assets or props, those could be just simple references or payloads. So now we'll just go through a nice 
tour of, um, we're calling this Demo Pack 2. So we're going to go through a tour of this building, looking at the things that Sebastian worked on uh, while he was doing the connected workflow back to the DCC source. Um, and then we can really just walk through the, the entire project. So to start, you're just seeing a simple Revit building here that is exported to, um, to Omniverse, and I'm adjusting the time of day. And what's super cool here, I probably should have started with this, is that we're rendering on uh, a GPU server that has eight A6000. So you don't need to have this kind of hardware to run it, but when you're in presentation mode, um, this is something that's really uh, powerful with GPU scaling is that we can take these large worlds and uh, view them in real time and in path tracing and really explore the project. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and enable our sunlight like so. So we went from a graphic style to more of a natural realistic lighting. You can see I adjust the time of day as well. And um, as a tour, we're, let's go through a few different cameras and look at this from, from a different vantage point. So we'll go down to the, the boardwalk level. So you can see that I have a nice graphic representation of this Revit building that is exported to Omniverse. Um, let's go ahead and pull in some Rhino and Grasshopper data. So we're going to look at the facades. And you can see as a payload, that's just loading in very quickly. Um, we're also using the USD variants so that we can quickly switch between facade designs. So I can click to a different facade and you can see this is loading in a different USD file that's going to, um, well, we're gonna wait a moment for the, the create to catch back up. So it's looking for the different data. Um, I am playing a little bit with fire here with VPN and connecting, but I think it's working just fine. So there we go. We swapped to a different um, facade option. I'll go ahead and let's take a look at this from, we'll switch to a different camera. Um, maybe I want to view this from a higher aerial perspective. So you can see this in the context of a city. And if you don't want to use a flat graphic style city, we use the city engine connector to connect in. So uh, to Omniverse, so let me hide this flat city model, so you can see just the building, and I'll load in some content that we used uh, City Engine and Rhino to build together. So when you're presenting large worlds in Omniverse, using the elements of references, payloads, and layers lets you swap in and out content very efficiently. And if I want to, I can go to the perspective view. And at this point, I'm really just flying around the world, so uh, in Omniverse. And I have a bunch more elements that I can turn on and off. Um, Sebastian went over a few of them, um, but let's go ahead and disable the building and the facades right now for just by just hiding them. And we're, let's look at something that may be on the interior of the building. So um, we showed a little bit of this before. There's a restaurant, showroom, and the lobby. So this is the base of the building. And you can see I can just fly around and view that from, from any perspective. And we also have a bunch of different apartment uh, mixes, we like to call them. So um, what's really exciting is that we're looking at thousands and millions of polygons um, all being referenced with payloads, uh, USD layers, and we can really just fly around and look at uh, your design in, in context of the rest of the building or the city. Um, it's really just having this data at your fingertips and knowing what you want to see for a given task. So. Um, we have some content that I can bring in really quickly for, uh, for the site, so we can fill in the, um, the ground area. I believe this was coming from 3ds Max, and we're also using the Omniverse um, catalog to populate this with different items. So you can see we've got trees and planters and little seating areas, and it's all 3D. It's all um, connected, so the idea is that you're really just experiencing your design or your setup however you feel uh, appropriate. And let me go ahead and just add everything back in so we can see the amount of data that we have available for this project. So I can add in a little bit more side entourage. You can see I have more uh, plants and tree, planters and trees on the street. Um, let's get that Revit base building back in so it makes more sense to have all that in context. And we even went ahead and built a, a roof deck patio. So let's put that in as well. So we've got a nice little seating area, roof bar. Um, yeah, so it's a whole bunch of different, think of them as little elements to a project that everyone's working in parallel, pushing this to Nucleus, 
and it's all being connected into this one omniverse world. So I think that's probably a good finale. Let me go ahead and add, I'll just change one more variant because I know this is a pretty one. This is one that Kobus designed. So he did a great job using um, Grasshopper and Rhino to uh, populate different variants. So everyone was respect on the team was using the tools that they love and they use day in, day out, connecting those into Omniverse and building a project that we assembled together uh, with all of the elements uh, that we described today. We've got our USD files, payloads, references, layers. We were doing Delta edits and we're building those up with variants and that's all being connected into our, our project assembly. Amazing. This was awesome, Amazing. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you, Great your, your team did such a good job presenting uh, presenting these these things. Um, so you, so much prep uh, and organization goes into it. So thank you for explaining everything so clearly. Um, and he's going to be a great resource for everyone who uh, who is looking to get started with Omniverse for ACO. Um, did we leave anything out at some point uh, that anyone wants to jump in and add at these last uh, last moments? Uh, just the one little thing. I think it's just good to note, and I think we mentioned it last time that. Um, between Krista and myself, we're probably the furthest apart. And I'm in London, and she's in Seattle, and Jay's on on the West Coast, and uh, you know George is in Chicago, and the others on on New York. And we all work together. Um, and I think that's that's just the little cherry on top of all this. It, there's no latency and issues. You know, we talk like we do during Slack and the likes, and we just model and assemble. So, which is awesome. That is great. Uh, I mentioned earlier that on uh, on Friday, Dave Tyner is going to be doing this live stream. Um, I think it's at 1.30 uh, p.m. Eastern with Marcom. And Marcom is based in Australia. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier. So uh, so there will be a cross-continental uh, um, live, live syncing with Omniverse. So it should be very cool. Um, uh, George, any any last parting words? I think I think the biggest thing is just, you know, you see what the power of USD is and what it can do. And we're, we're hoping to kind of break down the what seems like it's super complex, um, but it's not once you understand it and you kind of break it down. Right. That was the whole idea of breaking this project structure down. And so I, I'm hoping this, you know, goes a long way for people to understand how to set up a project, as Sebastian said. Right. Whether it's you yourself working or working with a team kind of once you have the fundamentals it makes it easier to kind of go through these processes and bring things in, right? Whether it's payloads, references, or layers. Yeah, like I said earlier, you, you it really do make it look so easy because I think it because it is easy. I think the uh, the interface has has come a long way. I would I would say too, uh, in the development of Optimers. I know also too. I want to I want to share that there's a big push right now internally uh, for the next updates to be very very focused on optimization. So. Mm -hmm. um, if anything you're doing right now seems a little sluggish or, you know, you're, you're dealing with crash once in a while, we're very well aware. Uh, and that's, a, that's a huge priority for us. Um, so, um, so anyway, they, uh, each build gets better and better, but there's a big push right now. So you should look forward to those improvements very, very soon. Um, speaking of soon, we've got CES coming, uh, in January, a lot of work internally, uh, all across NVIDIA for some really bl mind blowing presentations there. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, is the AECO and the CES is kind of more, more entertainment, yeah. but you guys, you guys aren't doing that. Okay. So you guys Unless we're needed, but so far. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, you're, you're, I'm sure your head's down for, for GTC, which is always around the corner. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, well, I'd like to thank everybody. If everyone has just a few minutes um, on the panel here, uh, on this dream team, we could hop over to the community room number one in Discord. If you have a, a conflict or got to head out, don't worry about it. Winnie and I will be over there. We'll, uh, we'll try to chat with some people in the community for a few minutes. So, uh, so that's an invitation to anyone watching right now. If you would like to chat with us uh, live, come on over to the Discord server, which is discord.gg slash NVIDIA Omniverse. And we're going to go to the community room number one. Uh, so if you'd like to chat with any of these super talented individuals from the AECO team or have a general Omniverse related question for Wendy or myself, uh, and we'd love to just say hi, even if you don't have a question. So, uh, but with that, Queen of the Stream, thank you so much. Another fantastic job. Thank you, uh, everyone. <laughs> the quality of the stream. So we'll see you tomorrow on the regular weekly stream. Um, and uh, and if you can join us in Discord in a few minutes, we'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks, everybody. Right, bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Is it